Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. Valerie. Philadelphia. You can never go home again. Or so they say. They also say there's no place like home, and at the moment I'm torn as to which statement makes the most sense. I'm standing in the driveway of my parents' house, the house I grew up in, suitcase in hand. Light snow falls around me, gathering in my long hair like white glitter. To add to the poetry of the scene, the house is all warm and glowing against the dark night and I can see the giant, perfectly decorated Christmas tree in the big bay window, just where it's always been. My cab drives away, plumes of exhaust rising behind it, and I'm alone on the street. It's such a change from New York City. Even though the suburbs of Philadelphia aren't anything to sneeze at, I'm already missing the hustle and bustle and anonymity of the city. Especially the anonymity. I take in a deep breath and walk carefully down the driveway, even though my father has probably shoveled and salted and sanded it a million times over. My gait is never that steady, even in shit kicker boots, so I'm usually more cautious than I should be. Before I can even knock on the front door, trying to find a spot that isn't covered with a giant Christmas wreath that looks like it was made from a small forest, the door opens. Riri, my oldest sister, Angie, exclaims, throwing her arms out and pulling me into a tight hug. The smell of my mother's gingerbread cookies follows her out, enveloping me too. You made it. Riri, her five-year-old daughter Tabby says, and the whole reason I have the Riri nickname, appears from behind her mother's legs, wiggling her fingers at me and wanting a hug. I drop my suitcase and crouch down to her level. Tabby is gorgeous, just like her mother with shiny blonde curls that Angie fears will go dark one day. How are you, Peggy Sue? I ask. My name is Tabitha, she says, scrunching up her face. Why do you always call me Peggy Sue? Don't worry about it, I tell her, giving her a squeeze. Are you excited for Christmas? Santa is coming tonight. I was hoping you were Santa. Well, you know he doesn't use the front door. He could. We just need to leave him the key. I grin at her, and when I get back to my feet I notice my father and mother have joined the impromptu greeting session in the foyer. They both come at me at once. My father with his arms out and a heartfelt, good to see you, baby girl. My mother with a sympathetic tilt of her head, hands clasped at her front. You look so tired. Of course I look tired. I've been pulling my hair out, stressed to the max crying non-stop for the last week. Figures my mother would point that out. She likes to get you when you're down. A second glance at my body from her warrants are proud, but you've lost weight. I ignore that and sink into my father's hug. He's always been so good at giving them. I think you look beautiful. Valerie, my father says to me warmly. He's very sensitive to the things my mother says these days, not like when I was younger. I'm glad you're here. Come in. 
Want some eggnog? Angie takes my suitcase away, tucking it in the corner, while my father hustles me over to the kitchen. On the polished granite center island is the eggnog punch bowl and the moose cups that my father bought decades ago, inspired by the Christmas Vacation movie. I think he still wishes he was Clark Griswold. Do you want to talk about it? My mother asks, leaning against the counter and tapping her perfectly manicured red nails against it. I'm guessing she asked her manicurist for a specific shade of Christmas red. She doesn't have to talk about anything, my father says as he pours me eggnog from the bowl, and it's then that I notice he's wearing his jolly snowman tie that he always wears on Christmas Eve. Here you go, sweetheart. Thank you, I tell him, and take a sip the rum and nutmeg hitting me hard. Whoa, Dad. This is strong. You need it, he says. Want a cookie? He turns around to bring the tray of freshly baked gingerbread men out, but my mother shakes her head. She doesn't need a cookie, she says, and then gives me a sweet smile. Hey, she can have a cookie if she wants it, he scolds her, narrowing his eyes. It's okay. I'm not hungry, I tell him, waving the cookies away. The truth is I've lost my appetite, so while I'd normally be tucking into one, this time I don't feel like it. At least this way I don't have to deal with the pre-cookie shame and calorie reduction calculations. Where's Sandra? I ask, changing the subject off of cookies and onto my other sister. She's out with her friends, my mother says, and I swear there's some kind of jab in there about me. While I was a bookish loner growing up and have just a handful of good friends, Sandra is the life of the party and is very social. More than that, she's spiteful. Whenever she's back in town for the holidays or some family gathering, she always goes to her old watering holes so she can show off. Now she's known to the world as Cassandra Stevens, an accomplished actress with her own STO meter on IMDb, and she loves rubbing her success in the faces of those who didn't believe in her. I don't blame her one bit. I often dream of the day I might do the same, shove any crumb of success in the face of all those people who called me a freak while growing up. Can I just say one thing? Angie asks, appearing beside us, holding a glass of wine. Angie, my father warns because we all know it's never just one thing when it comes to her, and whatever it is will probably hurt. She takes after our mother. I'm already wincing. No, really, it needs to be said, Angie says. I sigh. What? May as well get this over with because I figured this would be coming. I knew that boy was no good, she says. I knew it from the moment you met him. I mean, come on. His name is Cole Masters. He sounds like a villainous douchbag from a show on the CW. Douch bag. Tabby yells, even though I know she has no idea what it means. Angie, your language, my mother says, more for the fact that she hates vulgarity rather than any swearing in front of her grandchild. You're more civilized than that. As for my sister calling my ex-fiancé a douch bag, well, 
I can't argue with her. A month ago I would have defended him, but now there's no going back to that. I know, I say, my heart heavier than ever. I hate that everything Angie had been saying from the beginning was right. I met my fiancé, OK, X, just a year ago. We were at a mutual friend's birthday party in Bed Stewie. Cole is handsome as all get out. Movie star handsome. Even Sandra said he should be in films. But Cole was all about New York money and had huge success with an app and now heads his own company, all at the age of 27. He was also very enigmatic and persuasive and I fell for him hook, line, and sinker. The fact that he wanted me, just a lowly writer with more curves than straight lines instead of the size zero Instagram models with pillows for lips that were throwing themselves at him, took me for surprise. I suppose I managed to charm him as much as he charmed me. Our romance was a whirlwind that turned into a tornado that ended up in us getting engaged after only six months. And exactly one week ago, Cole pulled me aside in our shared apartment in Brooklyn and told me he wanted to call off the engagement. He wasn't sure about the marriage thing anymore but he wanted us to stay together regardless. I told him I'd think about it. Went for a long walk to the river and back. Managed to grow a spine for the first time in a year. Told him if he didn't want to marry me now, he probably wouldn't later. And yeah, I will fully admit we got engaged too fast, but I wasn't about to still stick around in a relationship with him when he didn't want anything more. Which meant, in the end, it was my fault that I had to move out of the apartment and sleep on my friend Brielle's couch for the last few days, and also my fault that I lost the man that I loved. Then again, if I really loved Cole, wouldn't I have chosen to stay with him even if he didn't want the commitment? I just don't know anymore. But Angie seems to know. She has that look on her face, and it's not just that her cheeks are raging pink like they always are when she drinks wine. Look, I'm sorry, I really am, she says while my father snorts. She gives him the evil eye. I am. You just like to tell her I told you so, my father points out before he has a long sip of his eggnog the drink getting on his moustache. No, she says, rolling her eyes, even though we all know my father is right. I just know what kind of guy Cole is. Believe me, I've been there. He wasn't any different from Andrew. My mom shakes her head, not amused. She hates any mention of Angie's ex-husband, one I'm tempted to point out was way worse than Cole. But this isn't a competition of who had the shittiest ex. Plus, he went to Harvard, Angie adds. That's bad news. You went to Harvard, I point out. And that's where I met Andrew, she says pointedly. Believe me, the guys that go there have egos the size of Jupiter. She pauses. It's a wonder I managed to stay so humble. I exchange a wry look with my father before I say to her, it's Christmas Eve. I don't want to think about how my life is falling to pieces right now. Let's just drink the eggnog and pick on Sandra when she gets back. 
But when Sandra does finally get back from her shenanigans at the local bars in town, we've already had my mother's Christmas Eve duck for dinner, my parents have retired to their bedroom, and Tabby's fast asleep in hers, leaving Angie and me downstairs blowing through bottles of wine. Val! Sandra squeals as she comes in the door nearly falling over as she runs to me in her snow-crusted high heels. Careful! Angie cries out, but Sandra just wobbles her way over to me, collapsing beside me on the couch in a fit of drunken giggles. She manages to drape her arms around me and starts swaying us back and forth. I've missed you so much. I pat her arms which are covered in some sort of shimmery lotion that sticks to me. I missed you too. Last time you were in New York you didn't even call me, I point out. I know, I'm so sorry, she says, burying her face in my hair and turning into dead weight. I think she's fallen asleep for a second but suddenly she perks right up staring at me with glassy eyes. But I only had a few days and I had meetings the whole time. I know you understand. I do understand. Even though she's got a supporting role on a crime TV show as one of the main character's girlfriends, she's becoming a bigger and bigger deal every day, which means she's traveling all over the world for meetings. Most of the time those meetings are just networking in bars and restaurants, but I totally get that her awkward younger sister wouldn't be allowed. Don't take it personally, Angie says to me. She's come to Chicago twice and didn't see me either. Which is why we're going to Ireland, Sandra says, pointing at her. In, like, four days. You'll be so sick of me, I promise. I don't doubt that, Angie says, smiling as she sips her wine. Why aren't you coming again? Sandra asks as she elbows me in the side. Ow, Jesus, those are weapons, Sandra. I swear she's gotten even skinnier now but that's what Hollywood does to you. That or my mother. Seriously, you should come, she goes on, leaning forward to pluck the bottle of wine off the coffee table. I can't, I tell her. Actually, the reason you couldn't before is because Cole didn't want you to. Isn't that right? Angie asks. I sigh and take the wine from Sandra and pour myself another glass before she has a chance to chug it straight from the bottle. It doesn't matter. The truth is, Cole had invited me to his parents' estate on Martha's Vineyard for Christmas and New Year's, and I had been extremely excited to go. He comes from a big, massively wealthy family. Now, my parents are well off but his are old money, the kind you only read about in like the great Gatsby. Cole also said if I went to Ireland instead, he'd miss me too much and that I'd fall in love with some Irishman. And he pointed out how badly his family wanted to meet me. So naturally I had to turn my sisters down which I'm now regretting. Big time. I mean, on one hand, there's the magic of Ireland, or the other where I'm woken up by Brielle's cat farting in my face every day. But you can work from anywhere, right? Sandra says, snatching the wine bottle back. Like, you don't really have an office. 
I wince as she proceeds to drink from the bottle. That's all hers now. I don't know where she's been. We do have an office, I point out. You just don't have to go. You can work from home if you want. Of course, now I don't really have a home so I'll probably start going to the office after all. Maybe they'll let me sleep under the desk. Geez, you young engines are so hip these days with your open concept. Show up if you want to, offices, Angie comments. Is that the future of journalism? I wish I had some comeback to that but she's kind of right. Though, at least she's recognizing what I do as journalism for once. See, I went to school at Columbia for journalism, and after navigating the very stressful freelance waters for a few years and hunting ceaselessly for something full-time and dependable, I finally got a job as the arts and entertainment writer for the online news site, Upward, shortly after I met Cole. It's pretty much my dream job. The pay isn't the greatest but I do get health benefits, and it's fun and exciting and I feel like I'm finally doing something with my life. Like I'm someone important, someone who stands out someone my parents can be proud of someone i can be proud of of course i'm still freelancing on the side because i'm always needing the extra cash but at least it's something i love and i can pay the bills a sharp snoring sound cuts into my thoughts and i look over to see angie with her head back in her chair fast asleep when she's out She's out. Sandra snickers. Man, she can't handle her wine anymore. To be fair, we had at least a bottle each, I point out. And she's been chasing Tabby around all day. She sighs and stares at me from under her heavy false lashes, looking both drunk and sincere. I'm really sorry I didn't call you last time I was in New York. It's fine. No, it's not. I'm sorry that I don't get to see you or Angie much anymore. Only when we're here for Christmas or birthdays or whatever. That's why I wanted you to come to Ireland. It should be a sister's trip. The Stevens sisters take on the Irish. I mean, it's our grandmother's homeland after all and you still look like you'd fit right in with the country. She picks up a long strand of my hair, dyed dark red, and tugs at it. Just come. I'll pay for everything. I give her a steady look. You are not paying for anything. I've saved up enough as it is, and anyway, I have to work. Right after New Year's is when everything starts up again. In fact, I'm supposed to turn in an article tomorrow and the day after that. She squints as she studies me, leaning in close until I smell her booze breath and pulls harder at my hair. I can tell you want to come. Don't lie about it. I'm not lying, I tell her, prying her fingers off my hair. I want to come. I just can't. She shakes her head. That's not it. You just can't be spontaneous. I can be spontaneous, I practically yell. No you can't. You're always trying to follow the straight and narrow. You're too afraid. I am not afraid, I tell her, feeling the wine fuel my defensiveness. 
How am I afraid? You worry too much about doing the wrong thing, she says. You worry too much about what people think. Especially what mom thinks. You work harder than anyone I know, yes even harder than Angie, and you're harder on yourself than you should be. You just need to, let go. Throw caution to the wind for once and live a little. I open my mouth but she raises her finger to shut me up. And before you tell me that you live in New York and throw all sorts of caution to the wind and that you and Cole were wild, no. That boy was not wild. He was a total sleazeball slime bucket, the kind that knows he's got the world at his fingertips. The type that pretended to work for everything he is when in fact it was all bought for already. Val, when I heard you dumped his ass, I couldn't have been more proud of you. I think it was the biggest bravest thing you've ever done. Technically he's the one who broke off the engagement, I mumble. And seriously, if breaking up with Cole was the bravest thing I've ever done, I've got to reevaluate my life. It doesn't matter, she says. If you were spineless you would have stayed with him, especially since it meant losing your home. But you kicked him to the curb. And I think, just by doing that, you're opening yourself up to a world of opportunities, including coming to Ireland. I'm going to bed, not Ireland, I tell her, not wanting to talk about it anymore. I get to my feet unsteadily and hold my hand out to help Sandra up but she waves me away. I'm going to hang out with Angie for a bit, she says, sipping her wine. Maybe draw a mustache on her. I glance at Angie who is snoring with her mouth open and drooling. Okay, but remember Santa is still coming tonight and that might put you on his shit list, I tell her. Oh honey, I've been on his shit list for years, she says, slurring her words in a way that makes me think she's going to spend the night on the couch. Good night. Night, I say, pausing to admire the sight of my sisters and the gorgeous Christmas tree in the background, both happy and heartwarmed to be at home with family and insanely scared at the same time. Because even though I don't want to believe it or think about it, what Sandra said unnerved me a little, like it exposed a hidden nerve until it was raw and beating. Have I been too afraid? Do I really care that much what other people think? I mean, I know I do, I can't help it. But I didn't think it was holding me back in life. And what exactly is all of this holding me back from? Valerie. Christmas blazes on in a mix of nostalgia, good cheer, and total frustration. Let's face it, unless you've been blessed with one of those perfectly functioning families that never fight or have complications, Christmas can be a major fucking mess. Everyone is striving to be kind and nice and loving and giving, but that can only go on for so long. Sooner or later the masks slip and the tongue lashings begin. This year, my family made it until Christmas dinner when my mother had a little too much wine and my father was a little too critical of the turkey and Tabby decided cranberry sauce made pretty watercolor art when applied to her brand new dress she'd only unwrapped that morning. Then the claws came out. My mother let it slip that I should have tried harder with coal. I knew she was disappointed that it didn't work out with him, 
Not because she felt bad for me but because she thought Cole would be my ticket to a better, more respectable life. Naturally, it made me cry, the excess alcohol over the last 24 hours didn't help either, which is something I usually do when I'm frustrated, and, well, I can't help but be brokenhearted at the same time. My tears made Sandra come to my defense which then made my mother go after Sandra for being too Hollywood and elite and forgetting where she came from. Which then made Angie stand up for Sandra, and then everything came out after that. My mother, feeling righteous and with a never-ending quiver of arrows on her back, let it fly that she was disappointed in Angie for not trying hard enough with Andrew. That was enough to make the entire table gasp. See, Andrew, Angie's ex and Tabby's father, cheated on her repeatedly. In fact, he was caught, the other woman publicly confessed, and it was a scandal that rocked the Chicago political scene to anyone who pays attention to that shit. Angie did the right thing and left his unfaithful ass, winning a big divorce settlement from him. And yet I always knew that my mom hated that Angie left him. She was always so proud of her, not for going to Harvard, but because she landed a rich and powerful man. It was more important that he went to Harvard, not her. When Angie first told my mother that she suspected Andrew was cheating, my mother advised her to look the other way, and it had probably bugged her ever since that Angie did the opposite. Suffice it to say, my father then started yelling at my mother and then she let some arrows fly at him and then the rest of us again, hitting the target every time until everyone left the table, foregoing the annual Christmas cake and fireside chats and everything else we usually do after dinner. Sandra went back out on the town with her friends, Angie took Tabby for a drive to look around at all the Christmas lights and I proceeded to go to my room and get in bed, much like I would have done as a teenager. It's funny how you so desperately try to have an adult relationship with your parents but after a while you all revert back to the way you used to be. Here, in this house, I'm back to being a teen again, feeling worthless and insecure and dreaming so big for something wonderful to happen to me something to take the pain away and erase all the years of shit that I had to go through. I'm full of hope yet feeling unseen. I want more but I don't know of what and I don't know how to get it. I feel as lost and alone as I've ever felt. Which gets me to thinking of my sisters as I fall asleep. Wondering if I'll ever get to know them as individuals and adults instead of falling back into our old roles. Once again, I wish I were going with them on their trip. Once again, I wish I wasn't going to be left behind. The next morning I wake up early. That's what happens when you go to bed at 9 p.m. But I'm not the only one up at this dark hour. My phone is buzzing incessantly. I roll over in bed, nearly falling off, and pick it up. For a moment I think it's coal, and for a moment I realize that's all I really want. For him to change his mind. For me to have a reason to go back to him and not look like a fool. I miss him so damn much, even though I shouldn't. But it's actually Denny, my co-worker, and his on a rampage. I have to keep scrolling back through all the texts because they keep coming in, rapid fire. Hey, have you heard anything about upward and layoffs? 
Not wanting to scare you or anything but Asisal why do you know anything? K I'm hearing stuff on Twitter about layoffs that are coming. I'm freaking the fuck out Val where are you? Yep I'm just looking again and Meredith is tweeting some shit about leaving. Ah uh, answer me you bitch. Oh my god check your email. From the first text I stopped breathing and I fear my heart is now permanently lodged in my throat. I don't even want to make sense of what he's talking about because to make sense is to wrap my head around. Layoffs. From upward. As in my job. Oh my god. Val did you get it? Are you done so too? I haven't even responded. I can't. I immediately go to my work emails and there I see it. A subject line from the CEO, massive layoffs. I didn't even think this was how things were done now but there you have it. What did Angie say about the future of journalism again? With shaking hands, I click on the email and read but the words just sort of come at me without sinking in. Then I do what Denny suggested and check Twitter, specifically Meredith's account, our editor-in-chief. Her tweet says, This morning almost my entire team at Upward was laid off. I resigned. This talented and dedicated group of reporters and editors are now looking for work, so if you're hiring and want introductions, DM me please. I'm then sucked into a Twitter rabbit hole, learning that the CEO also resigned, finding out more information as other organizations pick up the story and start reporting on who was laid off. I see my name, Valerie Stevens Arts and Entertainment Reporter, and it makes me wonder why they even sent an email at all when things travel so fast and viral and so very publicly. The speculation has already started on why 40 of us were let go. Apparently, the owner of Up Media Group wants us to concentrate more on videos and add content instead of the written word, something that hasn't been officially confirmed yet but seems to be the consensus. It doesn't matter anyway. I'm out of a job. I lost my dream job. I lost my fiancé, my home and my job within the span of a week. If this isn't my life officially crumbling around me now and the universe telling me to give up, I don't know what is. Somehow I managed to text Denny, I just saw. I need to process. And then I lie back in bed and stare at the ragged glow-in-the-dark stars on the ceiling and try to do just that. Process. But I can't. The dread and anger want to sink in. I want to throw shit around the room, I want to have a temper tantrum better than Tabby ever could and scream my head off. I want to punch the wall and ask what I did to deserve this, why I have to lose everything at once, why God hates me right now. I want to do all that and just let this new reality destroy me from the inside out. And yet it can't find its way in. Not right now. Not this morning. I'm thinking of everything that happened last night with my family and everything Sandra told me the night before. I'm thinking about fear and how I'm always so afraid and how I always play it safe and how I never stick my neck out. 
how I care too much what others think. I'm thinking despite all of that, shit still fell apart. Playing it safe gets you nowhere and being afraid won't save you. I'm thinking that I don't even know who I really am. But maybe it's time I find out. Suddenly, I throw back my covers and get out of bed, ignoring my phone which is buzzing with more texts, and I head down the hall to my sister's rooms. I go right to Sandra's room, throw open the door to see her crumpled in a heap in her bed, and say, I'm going with you to Ireland. What? She asks, confused and half asleep. Then I close her door and make my way down to the kitchen where I can hear Angie and Tabby puttering about. What are you doing up so early? Angie asks, pouring herself a cup of coffee. Even mom and dad aren't up yet. I'm going with you to Ireland, I tell her. She blinks at me in surprise. You are? What happened? I just got laid off, I tell her. What? Sandra says, appearing behind me, trying to tie her bedhead back. Are you serious? Angie asks. I nod. Just happened. Almost everyone has been laid off. The CEO and editor-in-chief resigned because of it. Holy shit, Angie says. That's huge. You guys were such a big sight. They want to concentrate on video more. Goodbye to the written word. I am so sorry, Sandra says, giving me a hug from behind. You are having the worst luck. The worst, Tabby repeats, chewing on the end of her toast. And so now I'm coming with you guys. Don't you dare retract your invitation. Of course not. Angie exclaims and brings out her phone. Hold on. Let me see if there are any seats on our flight. With any luck you can sit with us. Aren't you flying first class? I ask, eyeing Sandra. With Angie's settlement and Sandra's TV money, the two of them never have to worry about finances. We'll figure something out, Sandra says. But EA... You're coming. Are you sure? Angie asks, raising a suspicious brow. You're not going to get cold feet and back out at the last minute. Because once you get this ticket, you can't get a refund. I'm going, I tell her with as much determination as I can muster. Even if I do feel the fear starting to creep in again and those little voices asking me if it's a good idea. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I repeat, like a mantra. I'm going. Padraig. Dublin, Ireland. You have to come home, my grandmother says. Her words seem to echo, bouncing around in my head with no safe place to land. He's gotten worse. She pauses, her voice cracking. It's much worse than we thought. My grandmother is the strongest woman I know. Ninety years old and still going for walks every day to the beach and back still checking in guests to the shambles bed and breakfast, still putting you in your place with her razor-sharp tongue. I've never heard her voice be anything but steady. 
until now. That crack splits me right open. My father is dying. I know that's what she's saying. Padre, she repeats. Where are ye? I clear my throat. The brain fog has returned along with the rise in my blood pressure, making it harder to think. I'm at home. In Dublin. <laughs>